I used to play with ciphers a bit. Um, I started to look at the question of how modern ciphers work. Um, and and there's, there's all the ones that you can do by hand. Uh, and I started to look at those. But one of the things I very rapidly learned is that devising your own cipher is fraught with danger. Um, the, the, one of the most modern ciphers that we use, the one that's actually the basis of uh, all of the internet cryptography that we use, is, is really RSA, uh, which is allied with, very similar to uh, Diffie Hellman, Merkel Williamson, um, DHMW. They're kind of the same. I'll talk about RSA, it's the one that most people will know. The challenge with RSA, it looks really easy in terms of, of how you do it and how you implement it and you write a computer program and it does it. If you do that, it will be breakable because there are subtleties in the timing, there are subtleties in the heat generated, there are subtleties in the primes that you use. And recently somebody showed that by intercepting a huge slab of encrypted traffic and looking at it in pairs, they could actually decrypt 30% of internet traffic that was using RSA for reasons which were hitherto unsuspected. So it's absolutely critical that you get the cleverest people in the world looking at these to try to break them. Proving it's unbreakable is effectively impossible. Uh, even the one-time pad, because people will occasionally reuse the pad and then the message can be broken. Um, if you use it properly, it's unbreakable, but using it properly is almost impossible. So I have played with creating ciphers, and in fact for my day job, which involves using uh, radars to watch where ships are, I need to be able to get images back from remote locations to local lo locations. Um, and sometimes the people that we're doing this for say, can you encrypt the link? And the answer is, using off-the-shelf technology, no. Uh, for reasons which I will go into if anybody wants to ask me, but basically it's because it's not stream-based, it's packet-based, and we're allowed to lose packets without worrying about it. And no modern cryptographic system does that. So I have had to invent a means of encrypting the radar link, which uses off-the-shelf systems that are peer-reviewed and hammered and studied, but which work in this context that, that nobody's ever done before. I don't know that there isn't a weakness, but I'm pretty sure that there is no weakness, but I'm certainly not going to say that 100%, um, because there are such subtle things happen. Cryptography is deep, dark, subtle, mysterious, and will bite you if, you if you get it wrong. And in particular, if you rely on it, and somebody breaks it, they won't tell you they've broken it. They'll just continue to read your message while you think you are secure. And that's the real danger in this kind of area. This is what the Germans thought that Enigma was unbreakable. And so when there were messages, when, when the Allies took action that, based on having read the messages, the Germans thought there must be a spy. And in fact this sowed such discord within the ranks of the Germans. And that was, a, that was an unexpected side effect because they didn't believe that the cipher could be, the messages could be read, that the cipher had been broken. Um, uh, but, but history teaches us that every cipher will be broken and you won't know, uh, possibly for many, many years. Don't you put in one or two obvious things yes. here and there and see what your opponent does? Yes. Uh, the, the, the question is, uh, surely what you should then do is if you're using a cipher system, seed it with false information that you then see surface, either in the actions of your, of your opposition. Uh, and this is what they do with maps to test whether or not maps have been uh, copied, is they put in things that are wrong. Yeah. And in fact, it's what they do to test um, a proofreader. Uh, if if a, a publishing house employs a proofreader, they will sometimes deliberately seed errors into the text that they're being asked to proofread to see what percentage of those errors are caught. And in fact, there are different types of errors, like doubled words, uh, missing words, uh, transposed letters, and so forth. And different proofreaders are good at finding different types of errors. 
My wife is a, is a proofreader. She's brilliant at picking up doubled words, missing words, and transposed letters. She's not so good at a couple of other things that might happen. Um, so yes, this is the game of, of um, almost a, a meta-cryptographic analysis where you're no longer working on the messages themselves, which gives me the opportunity to mention that in 1942 or 43, when Enigma was again changed, and there was a period of several weeks where Bletchley Park could not read the messages, they could nevertheless follow the troop movements because they could recognize the Morse code fist of the individuals who were accompanying the troops. And they could use radio direction finding to see where they were. So they could follow individuals across the land. To, and they, they figured that the troops were moving with them. Uh, and so this is, this is traffic analysis, which is another area of, of, of intelligence uh, that you can use. So even though they couldn't read the messages, they knew where they were going. And you can deduce a great deal from where someone is going as to what you think they might be thinking. So yes, even if some, to, to defend against um, the, the problem that somebody may have been reading your ciphers, you can certainly seed it with false information and then see what the, the enemy does, see what the opponents do. Oh, the other thing is, at the end of World War II, uh, British intelligence gathered up all of the Enigma machines that they could find and went to foreign governments and said, look at these wonderful encryption machines, aren't they fantastic? and sold them to foreign governments for their diplomatic communications, uh, never revealing for, for many decades that in fact they had been completely broken. Uh, which I thought was, uh, yes, clever in some ways and, and devious in others, but the field is full of people who are very clever in some very, very inventive and sometimes very nasty ways. Uh, and the consequences uh, frequently dealt death to the people who got it wrong. Uh, it's it's an, an interesting field in which I do not wish to get involved. I like to know a lot about it, but I really don't want to get... I, I mean, I've, I've uh, actively avoided getting a security clearance. I don't want to be told things that I can't share. Because actually my joy is going out and telling people about stuff. So, you know, don't tell me things that are secret, because uh, I will go out and share them. This is what Maths Jam is actually about, and I'm, I'm just going to put in a quick plug for the, the Maths Jam weekend that's coming up in the middle of November, November 17th, 18th. It's over in England, it's a long way away, um, but it's a place for people to come and share stuff. Um, we've got a, a couple of things here which are, are, are new. So one of the things that I shared at, at, at a recent Maths Jam is how to measure the distance to the moon using a stopwatch and a pendulum. And you think, what? <laughs> Uh, but no, it, it, it's cool, cool and interesting stuff like that. That's what the Maths Jam is about. And, and so if you want to know more about that again, uh, ask us during the Maths Jam. Any other questions about the Turing stuff? Or indeed, anything else? Yes? Um, well, I'm, no, I'm very interested to hear you say that the, one of the many things you worked on was morphogenesis. Yes. Because I'm doing research in medical genetics. I'm studying the problem of developmental biology. Uh, right. So, yeah. I, I mean, so he's. Can you tell me? You published some of this stuff. Did you? Yes. Can you, do you know where you published it? Um, it? It's actually fairly readily available now because the Turing archives. Uh, are being put online. And I think pretty much everything that he ever wrote is now online. And you can find it fairly quickly. If you just do a web search for Turing morphogenesis, uh, you will very quickly be led to the papers. I, do, I, do, I don't know where they are, but the references are there. If you go to the Wikipedia page on Turing, uh, all of the references are there. Um, basically, the way morphogenesis works, if you think of it in two dimensions, um, you've got reactions that try to take place but there are also chemicals that inhibit the reactions. And so long as they're equally balanced, nothing happens. But like balancing a pencil on its tip, the smallest perturbation, and it will fall over. So you'll get in one place, by accident, uh, slightly more chemicals than, than inhibitors. So they start to do stuff, and they push the inhibitors out, but then the inhibitors are there and form a moat around it. So you end up with an island of what's happened. And that doesn't just happen here, it happens there and there and there. Like the giant's causeway, 
you get these, these collections of things. Now that's been done because the granite has shrunk, the, 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 uh, the rock has shrunk, and you get the hexagonal patterns because that's the most energy efficient way of, of doing that. But you get these pockets of where the reactions happen, surrounded by moats of inhibition. But that is not what actually causes the colour. The, the pigment is then sensitive to that. Some pigments are more sensitive than others. And if you look at the two different breeds of, of giraffe, the Roth, Rothschild giraffe and, and the other one, which I can't remember at the moment, uh, you'll find the sizes of the spots are different because the pigmentation is more sensitive in one than in the other. And the Wikipedia page on this is actually very, very good. And the references uh, are quite good. And if you have trouble tracking it down, do let me know and I'll, I'll do a bit of hunting, but I'm, I'm sure you'll find it as, as quickly as I could. He did, uh, he did, he wasn't doing this at Cambridge, he was doing this while he was in Manchester, so in the years 48 to 52, um, and uh, he was working on the baby at the time, working on, on that, but he was also working on, on uh, mathematical biology pretty much at the same time. Uh, and of course this crosses boundaries because you've got the, the biologists and you've got the computing side of it to try and work out what happens, and you've got the, the chemists and you've got the mathematicians. And it's, again, it's that crossing the fields and connecting the fields together. And yes, he did talk to the biologists who didn't believe it. I mean, it was, it was groundbreaking work. Um, the biochemists, well, the, 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 the clock reaction hadn't been found by then. And he predicted the existence of the clock reaction. Uh, the clock reaction, by the way, you take two chemicals and pour them into a container and it's clear. And then you sit there for a while and after about 40 seconds it goes black. Then after 30 seconds it goes clear. Then after 40 seconds it goes black. And it just keeps doing this for, a, for, for the longest time. And it's called the clock reaction for obvious reasons. And it, depending on the exact uh, uh, um, concentrations that you use, the timing changes. But this had never been seen in, in, um, in isolation like this. They thought something like this must happen to create stripes. Uh, but he did, he, he, he predicted the existence of the clock reaction. Uh, perhaps it might be the case that as you read his original paper, you can only see that with the eye of faith and knowing what comes. It may not be quite as explicit, but I haven't read those papers, so I don't know for sure. Thanks very much. That's a pleasure. Yeah, we've got a question here. Oh, tell us about the juggling and the fire breathing. <laughs> <laughs> The, 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 juggling, the juggling and the fire breathing. Okay, uh, in the mid-1980s, um, I learned to ride a unicycle, uh, as you do, and I went along to my university's unicycle society, and most of the people who were there could also juggle. So I made three beanbags, went along to the Jugglers Association, I said, I want to learn how to juggle five. I can juggle three, teach me how to juggle five. They all laughed at me. Um, and I learned to juggle four, and then I started to learn to juggle five. Juggling five is hard. Only the true obsessive compulsive with neither life nor friends would learn to juggle five. <laughs> and here I am. Um, but uh, it, it's really hard. And as I started to do this, I realized that I was in for a year of frustration. And so I went around and I tried to gather lots of little exercises to help me keep my focus. And I would write them down. You know, throw one over the top, throw one high, throw one under the leg. And then somebody showed me a pattern that was impossible to describe. And so I've tried to look for, for how to write down juggling tricks. And at the time, there was no notation for juggling. So some friends of mine and I invented a notation for juggling. And we hit upon a way of arranging the things that we knew that fell into patterns. Like Mendeleev, with the periodic table, we had the courage to leave gaps and the arrogance to say, that gap should be a juggling trick that we don't yet know. And it was. And we discovered new juggling tricks that nobody had done before. And so there's maths underneath that. Uh, and so as a net, net result of that, I go around and I tell people about how the juggling works, how the notation works, and how you can use it to predict the existence of juggling tricks, including juggling tricks that require balls to go backwards in time, which is cool. Um, so you do that. 
So anyway, uh, the other thing that you do, of course, if you go to a juggling club, is people have fire torches and machetes and, and uh, chainsaw, no, not chainsaws very often, but some do. Uh, and so I learned to juggle fire torches, I learned how to use a lathe, and I made my own fire torches. Badly balanced, but jugglable nonetheless. Uh, and of course, if you've got a fire torch in your hand, you think, fire, breathing. So you take a mouthful of fuel and spit it out and set fire to it. And thus I learned to fire breathe. Um, well, that's actually fire spitting, fire breathing is, is something slightly different. But, uh, but I, I learned a lot of different uh, circus skills because of that. And in, for a while I taught at the Cambridge Commu Community Circus School. And I taught unicycling and juggling. And in return, I learned tightrope and clowning and tumbling and stage makeup and all sorts of random stuff like that. Um, which, is, which is great because, again, it's, it's the sharing environment. It's, it's, it's showing people what you have and in return getting back so much more. Uh, and, and, and that was really cool. So, yeah, they, the, the juggling and the fire breathing and the unicycling and all of that kind of came as a, as a part of that. And it all came in its own right. And it was only after that that I discovered just how much mathematics there was underneath it. And in particular, the mathematics of tightrope walking is really interesting. Again, if you balance a pencil on its, on its point, then it, it will fall over. You have to move the bottom of something to keep it stable. But if you're on a tightrope, you can't move it. If you're on a slack rope, you can. Never learn to do a slack rope. But if you're on a tightrope, you can't move your point of contact. So if you start falling off one way, how do you fix it? Newton's third law tells you that flinging your arms over that way doesn't work, because that just flings your body that way and you still fall. So Newton's third law actually doesn't work. And so the mathematics behind that works is, the way that works is really cool. Which is why you can actually balance on the back legs of a chair. If you do that, do not hold me responsible for what happens. But it's possible to balance on the back legs of a chair without being in contact with anything. Uh, and and the, the mathematics underneath all of that is really cool. And I kind of feel a connection with Turing because he investigated so many different things. Um, and and, and I, I dabble in so many different things. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not in the class of Turing. I've, I've met people who are. I've got a very good foundation on exactly what my limitations are in that regard. But I love to, to, to find the connections between a whole pile of things. My wife says I have a butterfly mind, but I, I actually th I think I have a moth mind. It's not as attractive and it only comes out at night. Um, and, and, but, but I do tend to, to flit between topics and finding the connections between them. Is, uh, is the really fun part. So finding the maths underneath the juggling is such a bonus. Uh, really cool stuff. If you want to know more about that, I can do about six hours on that. So <laughs> I will answer questions. You may regard that as a threat. Um, but uh, I'll try and keep the answers for this bit. <laughs>